recording. I'm going to make a few remarks relative to the holiday that's coming up Monday. I think it's an important day. I think it's pretty much lost its meaning to most of the younger generation, and that's why I want to make a few mentioning comments that stop and realize what it cost someone for you to just sit here today. To be able to gather like we're gathering, I think, if my memory serves me correct, and I, I could be corrected on this, but I think there's around 400,000 graves in Arlington Cemetery. I think I heard Vice President Pence in one of his speeches, I think it was last year's speech, saying that there were somewhere in the neighborhood of a million American soldiers have given their life in defense of our country from its inception till today. That's a lot of lives, isn't it? A million men and women have died defending your right to be free. And uh, Memorial Day started out as Decoration Day, and it changed from a certain date. It was, it was first given a, a rigid date, and then the Monday holiday thing came into being in America, and it was switched to this particular Monday, giving us a long weekend to picnic, have cookouts. There's nothing wrong with picnics and cookouts. But I think we ought to stop and pause and think about this holiday for just a moment and recognize in recognition of those that have given the, the ultimate sacrifice for our nation. There's a stirring tribute. I found it. I posted it on social media, but some of you don't utilize that. But if you'd like a link to the video, it's a... It's a former POW, spent, I think, five years in a Vietnamese prison camp. He gives a stirring Memorial Day message and reminder. And I think every young person ought to hear those messages of these brave men and women that have sacrificed. And while he was one of, oh, I forget, 12 men that lived through that him and his buddies were captured by the Vietnamese, and I don't remember now how many started out in that jungle prison, but I think only 12 of them survived the horrors and the deprivation that they faced. But Memorial Day is to recognize our fallen soldiers, and I think every one of us need to stop uh, at least and pause and think about it. I had quite a bit of material, but I'm going to really condense it this morning. I have some words from Ronald Reagan that I'd like to, to read to you. It comes from three different speeches. I've taken clips from three different speeches from Ronald Reagan, who I now consider the second greatest president we've ever had. I've elevated Donald Trump to number one. His stand for the churches. <laughs> His stand for the unborn has elevated that man, in my opinion, to the very best president America has ever had. Forty million unborn babies, where a million men and women have died in combat, there's 40 million babies that have died in America needlessly. But that's another story, that's another day, that's another message. You and I, he said, have a rendezvous with destiny. We will preserve for our children this the last best hope of man on earth. Or we will sentence them to take the first step into a thousand years of darkness. If we fail, at least let our children and our children's children say of us, we justified our brief moment here. We did all that could be done. Freedom is never more than one generation away from extinction. We did not pass it to our children in the bloodstream. It must be fought for, protected, and handed on for them to do the same. Or one day we will spend our sunset years telling our children 
and our children's children what it was once like to live in the United States where men were free. Isn't that a sobering thought? We have to explain to our children what it was like to enjoy freedom. I didn't get this quote verbatim, but the gist of it went like this. He said, the men who died in battle gave two lives. The one they were living and that the one that they would be living today if they had not given that first life for the cause of our country. They gave up the chance to be husbands, fathers, and grandfathers. They gave up the chance, and he's speaking as an old man here. He said, they gave up the chance to be like us, revered old men. They give up everything for their country, and all we can do is remember and be grateful. Now, that's all we can do for them. But I believe there's more than that can be done for the cause of freedom. As they gave their life and strength and courage and, and boldness on the battlefield, friend, it's time for Americans to use what means we have here in the homeland to preserve this glorious freedom that we have. We, it's up to us. It's our duty to stand up for the freedoms that we have inherited. It's just as much our duty to preserve them as it is the military and the soldiers on the battlefield. We must use every means to stop this movement to destroy our nation that's called socialism. Every American patriot should be at the ballot box voting for those who stand for constitutional freedom, Christian values, and love of country. Our voices should be heard in opposition to the tyranny that is being exploited on our people right here in America by Governor Whitmer, the mayor of Chicago, the mayor of Pennsylvania, and on and on and on, to name a few. People can't open their businesses. They can't leave their homes in some places without fear of repercussion. In some places, you still can't open your churches for fear of being fined or imprisoned. That mayor in Chicago had cars towed off the street that was near a church. People that live near a church and park their car on the street because of, I guess, there, maybe there wasn't enough room in the driveway. Those cars got towed just because they were in the proximity of a church. And yet, where's the outcry? Where is the outcry? Are we going to put these same people back in office that have shredded our Constitution, done despite to the spirit of America and disgraced the flag and the men who died for that flag. Friend, we need to rise up. Something needs to stir within the Christian people. He said, well, I don't believe Christians ought to get involved. Well, it's a good thing our forefathers didn't believe that or you wouldn't be able to sit here today. You'd still be under the British flag. How many of those that signed the Declaration of Independence were ministers? But let me say this morning on this Memorial Day Eve that we need to stop and ponder the things that God has blessed us with through the efforts of, of many, many sacrifices down the way. You and I have come to live and enjoy a free America. And there's much, much, much can be said about that but I must leave that part of it with you this morning, but I believe it would pay you to educate yourself somewhat on what it takes to keep a free republic and then cry out against everything that comes against it. Amen? Amen. Turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 10 for the beginning scripture. I'm going to be reading a lot of scripture this morning, so don't go to sleep. Thank you, Ronnie. He gets back there and does his little movements. Helps me to remember there's one more button to push. All right. I don't know if there's anyone on the phone conference, but we welcome you if you're here. 
And for those of you that may not know, that's why I wear this collar, so that the connection to the phone is good and clear. And uh, we've had a number of folks across the months that we've been doing this that have commented on the uh, glad that we were providing that means of hearing the gospel. Matthew chapter 10, picking up the reading with verse 16. Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be ye therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. But beware of men, for they will deliver you up to the councils. They will scourge you in their synagogues. Ye shall be brought before governors and kings for my sake for a testimony against them and the Gentiles. But when they deliver you up, take no thought how or what ye shall speak, for it shall be given you in that same hour what ye shall speak. For it is not you that speak, but the Spirit of your Father which speaketh in you. And the brother shall deliver up the brother to death, and the father the child, and the children shall rise up against their parents and cause them to be put to death. Ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake, but he that endureth to the end shall be saved. But when they persecute you in this city, flee you into another. For verily I say unto you, ye shall not have gone over the cities of Israel till the Son of Man be come. The disciple is not above his master, nor the servant above his Lord. It is enough for the disciple that he be as his master, and the servant as his Lord. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more shall they call them of his household? Fear them not, therefore, for there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed, and hid that shall not be known. What I tell you in darkness, that speak ye in the light, and what ye hear in the ear, that preach ye upon the housetops. And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul. Listen, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a farthing? And one of them shall not fall on the ground without your father, but the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear ye not, therefore ye are more value than many sparrows. Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father, which is in heaven. But whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father, which is in heaven. Think not that I am come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. I am come to set a man at variance against his father, and the daughter against her mother, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's foes shall be they of his own household. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. He that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. And verse 39 will conclude the reading at this point. He that findeth his life shall lose it. He that loseth his life for my sake shall find it. Father, we thank you this morning for this assembly. We thank you for everyone that's here this morning. We thank you, Father, for everyone that will hear the message this morning via the telephone or later when it is put online. Father, we pray that this message will go out and your word would not return void, but that you would take this message and open eyes this morning, open the mind of the church we pray, Jesus, in your name for your help this morning. Amen and amen. This morning that the chip is the mark of the beast, I can't say that for sure. I haven't seen all and understand all about it, but I want to tell you they are, they are programming us and and they are, are channeling us uh, right into the funnel that's going to lead people down to accepting the mark of the beast. I don't know. I'm very curious about this digital certification tattoo. I want to find out more about that. My friend, we need to be aware this morning about what the Bible says about the mark of the beast. 
You've heard preaching on it for 30, 40, 50 years that it's coming. It's right around the corner. It's right around the corner. Listen to me this morning. Because the seriousness of this is given to us in the book of Revelation where it tells us that every man, every woman, every boy, every girl, and I'm going to, I'm going to add above the age of accountability, I believe that the children will still be innocent if they're below the age of accountability. But every one of us this morning that is above the age of accountability needs to read what the book of Revelation says about the mark of the beast. It says very clearly that if we take the mark of the beast, we will suffer eternal damnation. There is no repentance. There is no forgiveness. There is no option for you if you receive the mark of the beast. What's the mark of the beast? It's a mark in your right hand or in your forehead that the, mark, that the Antichrist is going to mandate. Is Fauci the Antichrist? Is Bill Gates the Antichrist? I don't know the answer to those questions yet. I believe it will become clear to us as time goes on. But the message I have for us this morning is we need to begin to realize, and we've heard it for years and years, I started preaching this probably 30 years ago, that America may suffer persecution. And as I read Matthew chapter 10, as I've read over it time and time and time again, and you have too, did you ever stop and think that, that might, you might be in that scenario? Did you ever stop and think that they're going to take you before the governors and before kings for the testimony of Jesus Christ for resisting what the government says you have to do? Did you ever stop and think that the church world as we know it is going to be faced with a choice very soon of whether we comply with the government and go along with their program or are we going to take a stand and keep ourselves clear of this one world antichrist system? Stop and think with me, friend, because the consequences are tremendous. We need to educate ourselves. We need to be on our prayer bones. We need to be seeking divine discernment as to the times, as to what is all right with God and what is not all right with God. Because if you do not take the mark of the beast, the key thing about that, in, as revealed in the book of Revelation, is that you won't be able to sell or buy without the mark of the beast or the number of his name or the name of the Antichrist. You say, what's knowing his number going to get us? I don't know how that's going to work. I don't think I've met or read anybody that had the answer of how that's going to work. It's going to be found out when the time comes. But friend, the thing is that everyone whose name is not in the Lamb's Book of Life will take the mark of the beast. My Bible says so. Read it for yourself. 13th, 12th, 13th, 14th chapter of Revelation. Read that and you'll find that everyone who's not a Christian is going to accept the mark of the beast. And everyone that accepts the mark of the beast is going to be cast into a lake of fire at the judgment. There is no changing that destiny. And there's two things in America that are, that are hindering the church in America that we're going to have to reprogram. We're going to have to reboot spiritually, the way we think about suffering, the way we think about uh, staying true to God, the, the way we think about giving our life for the cause of Christ, we're going to have to reboot. Number one, we've always thought that our freedoms would prevail. We've always thought that America would stay free. We've always thought that she was too big to fail. Look at her now. Look at what they're doing now. Look at how rapidly it's transpiring. They've had flu vaccines out for how many decades? How many can tell me the flu is extinct? Still have a flu season, don't we? At a regular time, appointed time? What does that tell you? <laughs> they can tell you when it's going to start, where it's going to start, and how bad it's going to be. What does that tell you? Well, some little virus told them. No, they told some little virus when they dump it out. 
Friend, we're under a system right now that is gearing toward, moving toward a one world government. And if you can't buy or sell at the local supermarket, if you can't do transactions at the local bank without your chip or without your ID tattoo, if you can't go to work because your employer says if you've not been vaccinated and you don't have the the the, vac the, the digital certification, doesn't that sound good? They put such interesting words on the things they want to do. If you don't have that digital certification and the one diagram that I saw of it, it was like a hologram tattoo on your wrist. Just proving I've been vaccinated. I've went along with the government plan so that I can still exercise my free rights to free enterprise. You can take the word free out of all that economy. Take the word free out of all that discourse because it's not going to be free anymore. The government's going to tell you if you can buy or not. They're going to tell you if you can work or not. They're going to tell you if you can go to church or not. We've often heard the stories of missionaries from China, Brother John Knight and others, about the house churches in China, how they're being raided, how those poor people are being thrown in prison and persecuted. We never thought that it would ever be remotely possible that it could happen here, did we? We have to reboot, friends. America is changing, and she's changing right before your eyes. And if you don't get your head out of the sand and reboot and think if we can do anything to promote revival, if we can do anything to discourage this thing by voting, by standing up, by writing the editor, by calling in talk shows, whatever you can do to let your voice be heard. Demonstrate. I'm not against demonstration. It's as long as it's peaceful. I think we as Americans have inherited something that our children will never enjoy if this generation sits by. You've heard the story of the guy in Europe. He said, when they come and got the Jews, we just, we just watched. Then we, they come and got the Catholics, and we just watched. And then they come and got another group of ethnic group, and we just watched. And he said, then they came and got us. So those of you who think you're exempt from the persecution or exempt from the, the loss of freedom, you need to reboot. You need to reprogram your thinking. America is crumbling morally. She's been crumbling morally for decades. Spiritually, she's bankrupt. Our churches have socials. Our churches have entertainment. Our churches have everything but the rugged gospel of Jesus Christ that saves men from sin. In one way, friend, the churches in America have deemed themselves non-essential because they haven't done a thing to help poor man get out of his plight. But I'm here to tell you this morning, we need to reboot. We need to rethink our position on this thing called freedom and this thing called persecution because Jesus said, he said, you beware of men. They'll deliver you to the councils. They'll scourge you in their synagogues. You'll be brought before governors and kings for my sake. And when they deliver you up, don't take any thought for what you're going to say. The Lord's going to give you what you need to say at that time. You go on down through there. <clears throat> it says they've called the master Belzebub. They'll call you the devil. How many have noticed the change in attitude of the, toward Christianity in America? I may have told you this before, but David Gibbs said 20 years ago, he said, as they begin defending Christians in the public arena for a violation of their Christian rights and Christian freedoms, he said, we used to always opt for a trial by jury. A trial by jury is a trial by peers from your community. People out in your community were, were favorable to churches. They were favorable to Christian values. He said, and he said this probably 20, 25 years ago, he said, we almost never opt for a trial by jury anymore. We try to persuade the judge. We can do better persuading one man than we can 12 about the validity of the case because the attitude toward Christianity is changing. It's becoming violent. 
You probably saw in the news this week or read it in the paper, heard it on the radio somewhere. You heard about the church in Mississippi that was going to open back up. And the good socialists of that community, whoever they were, the arsonists, they burned the church down to keep people from going back to church. They were illiterate or poor spellers when they wrote in chalk in the parking lot that you won't, guess you won't be coming to church, you hypocrites. H-Y-P-O-K-R-I-T-E-S. They're smart enough to burn the building down, but they weren't smart enough to spell hypocrite. You ever see such animosity in America? We really need to realize, folks, we can't depend and sit back on our laurels and rest on the freedoms that we've enjoyed all these years. They're quack, quickly eroding. The second, what I believe to be a, a mistake, has been propagated by the church. And that is that there's going to be a pre-tribulation rapture. And we're all going to be taken out before things get nasty. Isn't that a wonderful thought? Brother George Schaefer would pinch himself. He says, my flesh says pre-trib because my flesh don't want to hurt. But my mind says it's not going to be that way. And you know, I've been unchurched by preachers 25 years ago because I didn't believe in a pre-tribulation rapture. I've been de-Christianized by some men who preached the gospel, said, if you don't believe in the imminent return of Jesus Christ, you're not even saved. I just have one verse for them. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Paul said, as concerning the coming of the Lord, he said, it's not even needful for me to write unto you, for you know that that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin, the son of perdition, be revealed, friend. The Antichrist must be revealed before Jesus comes. And who's the Antichrist going to make war with? Not the world. It's going to be a time of peace in the world. They're going to all come together. Everything's going to be great for them. This Antichrist is going to solve their problem. The satanic trio is going to solve their problem. But the persecution of the church is the thing that hinders the Antichrist. The church will be persecuted. And the fact that we've been taught for many decades now that the church is going to be raptured out, everything's going to be hunky-dory, we're going to get out of here before the fire starts falling, we're going to get out of here before the, the wrath starts to take place, and we escape everything. Isn't that a wonderful theory? And I hope it's true. I hope I'm dead wrong. If I've ever hoped in anything that I'm wrong, I hope I'm wrong in this. Because I told the Lord, Lord, if I'm seeing something that's not there or I'm not seeing something that is there, I tell you, Lord, I want to go out on the first bus load. The first load out of here, I want to be on that. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection on whom the second death shall have no power, thank God. I want to go out in the first resurrection. But I don't see that first resurrection happening at least until the Antichrist is revealed. I do not find a seven-year period in the Bible mentioned, but I find over and over and over through the Old Testament and the New Testament that the, this period of time where this one world powers who's going to come in, by Satan is going to furnish him the power and the miraculous works that he does. He's going, to be, he's going to be supported by the devil himself and he's going to last for 40 and two months. It listed in the time, times, and half a time. It talks about 1,200 and some days, which if you divide that by 360, which was the Jewish year, you're going to find that's three and a half exactly. There's going to be a three and a half year period where the Antichrist is going to do his job. As far as how long the great tribulation, which we would consider the wrath of God, is going to last, I don't see a number. Maybe you can enlighten me after church. But between these two theories, the theory that America is too big to fail, we've had freedoms and we'll always have the same freedoms, that mindset has to be changed. 
And friend, you may seriously consider changing your mindset that you're not going to have to go through anything before we leave here. Because a person who's expecting to be delivered before the trouble starts is not adequately mentally and spiritually prepared if that doesn't take place. So it won't hurt you any. It's going to take as much grace to go through the rapture as it does to go through the tribulation. It's going to take as much grace to go up when the trumpets sound as it does to give your life if called upon to give your life. But Jesus here talks about them. He says here, Fear not them which kill the body. And if you look over in the book of Revelation, I think it's the sixth chapter, there is the vision of those souls that are under the altar there, and they are what the Bible calls martyrs. Do you know what a martyr is? It's just like our fallen troops. It's heroes of our faith that have given their lives for the cause of Jesus Christ. And under that altar are those martyrs and they're crying out to God, how long, O Lord, until you avenge our blood on them that are on the earth? In other words, they were crying out for vengeance against the enemies. And the Lord's answer to them is not until your brethren have suffered like as you have. In other words, there's going to be some more martyrs before they can be avenged of the deaths that they've died. Friend, the Bible is very plain. Jesus is very plain here. He said, Fear not them that can kill the body, but rather fear him that is able to destroy both body and soul. He tells us that if you do not confess him before men, if you do not take your stand before men, the governors, the kings, the rulers, the councils, if we don't take our stand, neither will he own us. You read this chapter 10 very carefully, would you? He said, I'm not come to send peace. I'm come to send a sword. I'm come to send parents against children, children against parents. And I want to tell you something, friend. When the time comes and you have to draw the line, whether it's God or your children, there's a lot of people fail that test. There's a lot of people that will put their children ahead of God. And there are children that will put their own wicked, rebellious ways before their parents. And even the Bible says here that they're going to betray one another. The parents are going to betray the children. The children are going to betray the parents. A man's foes are going to be those of his own household. God forbid in our families. We need to settle it to go with God. The whole family. Go with God. So this cannot be a possibility. But friend, I know some parents. I've watched parents compromise and cave in when their children demanded or put the pressure on. So when it comes down to life or death, when it comes down to buying or selling, when it comes down to eating or not eating, and your children say, Dad, I'm hungry. Or your children go down to the council and say, My daddy hasn't had the vaccine. My daddy hasn't had the chip. You don't, think, you don't think it'll happen? You know it'll happen. My Bible is true, friend. And everything that this chapter tells, you say, well, oh, that's for the Jews. Friend, I believe that this prophecy includes you and I at this very moment. A man's foes will be those of his own household. He that loved father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. He said, he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he that's not willing to take up his cross, and the cross was not an ornament. It was not a furbished piece of brass or a tie clip. It was, friend, a sign of death. It was a symbol that you're willing to give your life. When you take up your cross, Jesus was saying, you're willing to lay your life down for me. He said, if you don't take up your cross, you're not worthy of him. You know, we've got to get this mindset out of our mind that suffering is a sign of God's displeasure. That persecution and opposition must be a sign of God's pleasure. When you read it, just the opposite in Matthew. Blessed are ye when men shall persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my name's sake. Friend, there is something to be said in this hour that they're going to come against us. They're already coming against us. But we've not seen anything yet. 
And we have to just kind of separate in our mind this idea that bad things can't happen to God's people. Ask Richard Wormbrand. Have you ever read his book, Tortured for Christ? You should read it. You should read it. A Romanian pastor put in a prison. His dear wife was also put in a prison. Horrible circumstances. Tried every way to break the man. Say, it can't happen in America, preacher. Friend, what I've seen in the last 20 years, I would have thought 30 years ago could never happen in America. I would have never thought we would have legalized homosexual marriage. I would have never dreamed that 30 years ago. We've got to do some reprogramming, church. Turn over with me, and I know this is going to get lengthy if I keep going, but turn over to 1 Peter. Let me read you some scripture. 1 Peter chapter 3. Verses 12 through 18. I wanted to read verse 12 for your comfort and consolation since I'm giving you some bad news this morning. Verse 12 says, For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open unto their prayers. Thank God. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. And who is he that will harm you if ye be followers of that which is good? But and if ye suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are ye, and be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and in fear, having a good conscience that whereas they speak evil of you as evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. For it is better, if the will of God be so, that ye suffer for well-doing than for evil-doing. Did you get that? It's a much better proposition if you're suffering for doing right. It says here, For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God and being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. Jesus gave a full sacrifice. Look at chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. For as much then as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. For he that has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lusts of men, but to the will of God. Talking about getting a mind that's open to the concept of suffering. Drop down to chapter, uh, or verse 7 through 19 of that same chapter. But the end of all things is at hand. Be ye therefore sober and watch unto prayer. And above all things have fervent charity among yourselves. For charity shall cover the multitude of sins. Use hospitality one to another without grudging. As every man hath received the gift, even so minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. If any man speak, let him speak as the oracle of God. If any man minister, let him do it as with the ability which God giveth, that God in all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom be praise and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Verse 12, But think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you. But rejoice inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when the glory shall be revealed, you may be glad with exceeding joy. If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye. For the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part he is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. Let none of you suffer as a murderer, or a thief, or an evildoer, or as a busybody in other men's matters. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. Paul called himself the prisoner of the Lord, didn't he? Through all his prison ministry, he was able to write several epistles. He was able to convert some of Caesar's household. Can you imagine being chained to the Apostle Paul for eight hours shift at a time? 
Can you imagine what a sermon you would get? What a testimony. He would start out telling you about the road to Damascus where the light of the noonday sun shined so bright that it blinded him. And he heard a voice from heaven saying, Saul, Saul, why person? Can you imagine the testimony time that Paul would have given that old Roman centurion? And it says, when he addressed some of his letters, he said, unto they of Caesar's household. Right in Caesar's palace, some of them gave their heart to God through the ministry of this man who was being persecuted wrongfully, imprisoned wrongfully. Friend, we need to get our mindset that we may need to do some of this for the glory of God. This is not for sissies. This is not for wimps. This is not for... for uh, I have to be careful not to use too strong a slang here. We just can't give in, friends. It's time for men to be men and women to be women and say, I love the Lord enough to give myself for him if it takes my life. But it says here, if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel? And if the righteous scarcely be saved... Where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? Think of that. Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing as unto a faithful creator. Chapter 5, verse 7, Casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. But the God of all grace, look at here, who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that you have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Friend, the church is going to be called upon to take a stand by Jesus Christ. And while we don't have all the answers to this thing, we can see clearly where it's leading. And when the Antichrist sets up his kingdom, there will be a mark of the beast. These things may or may not be, but they're leading up to it. They're they're getting our mind, they're getting us programmed to accept whatever they say and do whatever they say. Something to think about, huh? Something to pray about. Something to rally to the cause. I like what old David said. He came into camp as a little shepherd boy. Here's the army of Israel terrified. Terrified, because one big mouth man was out there defying the whole army of Israel. And David looked around. What is wrong with you guys? Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the God of heaven? And David asked a question Is there not a cause? Is there not a reason to fight? Is there not a reason to take this braggart out? He said, I don't believe in fighting. I believe in a peaceful religion. Well, you'll have to do away with the verses that says fight a good fight. Fight a good fight. I tell you this morning, church, we're, we're in a dilemma. We're in a dilemma. 